Hi everyone, welcome to the panel discussion on the future of sociology with, um, let's see if I get it right, Nurce, Nurce Mares and Craig Kaloon. Uh, they've both given me permission to call them by their first names. Um, so Craig is professor of sociology at Arizona State University and a former director of the London School of Economics to which he's still affiliated as Centennial Professor. Um, they're both extremely prolific authors, so I'm not going to give them your lists of publications. Um, I'll just say that um, Craig uh, has uh, written on a wide uh, variety of topics, um, including um, social theory, the Industrial Revolution, China, nationalism, and uh, geopolitics. He is the author or um, editor of um, over a dozen volumes, uh, among them this one, um, which is co-written with Emmanuel Wallerstein, Randall Collins, Michael Mann, and Georgi Derlugin, uh, titled Does Capitalism Have a Future? Uh, it came out in 2013. Nurje is director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Methodologies um, at the University of Warwick, um, and she is currently a visiting professor at the Center for uh, Science and Technology Studies at the University of Leiden. Um, her work also straddles multiple areas of research, um, including technology, especially digital technology, um, public engagement, and uh, research methods. In 2017, she published this book titled um, Digital Sociology, and since, since then she's been involved in several projects about um, creative and, correct me if I'm wrong, slightly non-academic ways of getting to know the social work, of doing research and getting to know the social work. She's going to tell us um, a little more about these uh, tonight. Um, Nurje, Craig, uh, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, welcome to Neuchatel. Thank you. So, um, I know you've come here to listen to them. I'm just going to say a few words to uh, set the scene. Uh, the thrust for this panel um, lies in some dramatic and disturbing developments um, that actually occurred outside uh, the labor market. Uh, the anxieties that uh, we feel about the future of work but whether jobs are vanishing, uh, seem to be connected to uh, other developments in other areas of social life, uh, such as Brexit, such as Trump, uh, such as the election of other authoritarian leaders in other parts of the world, um, especially, uh, or for instance, Brazil recently, um, and perhaps as well to um, other striking social phenomena, social phenomena like the waves of migration, uh, massive migration at the southern borders of the US or Europe. Um, jobs, jobs, jobs is one of the memorable lines used by um, Donald Trump on the campaign trail. And our experience and knowledge of these events is mediated, if not produced, by the social media. Um, the digital social media, and uh, other forms of media as well. And so the first goal of this panel uh, is to have an educated, uh, rather casual conversation with two people who know and understand these developments perhaps a little better than the rest of us about what they mean, about what's going on. Uh, the second goal is to try to draw some of the implications of these developments for ourselves as sociologists in terms of our research, uh, in terms of the theories that we uh, use or build, and perhaps also in terms of our engagement in the public sphere. So we have one hour for all this, so <laughs> we should be good. Um, my first question uh, for both of you um, is, 
from your own and um, different perspectives as people who study uh, structural change in different realms of um, the social world, uh, what's your take on what we're seeing? Uh, and specifically, are we in the midst of a structural crisis? Uh, this is just a warm up question, by the way. Uh, Nurje, if you want to start. Well, this question has become um, much easier to answer in the last uh, year or so, uh, being a, a European uh, citizen who lives in Britain, um, where um, we have been um, yeah, witnessing in, in sort of the slow time of many months unfolding uh, the dismantling of, of uh, accountability um, arrangements. Uh, with Parliament um, having been closed since last Tuesday. Um, I still think, though, that when speaking about crisis um, and the possibility of us living through this crisis, which I think we are, that it's very important to recognize their multiplicity. So our crises are manifold. Uh, we have a crisis, yes, of democracy in Britain, but we have crises of care. We have crises um, of um, uh, gender relations. Um, we have crises of many different kinds um, and, of, and on many different levels. And of course, also crises of, um, of work-life balance. Um, but we'll, we might come to that later. Why call all of those varied why, why use the word crisis in relation to all those varied domains? For me, it would be to signal that there's both a, like a proliferation of very urgent problems, problems that require responses now. Um, and I think we have all have examples we can think of. But also that we observe a lack of um, effective institutional action on these problems, or perhaps more precisely, a lack of um, problem-solving capacities uh, on the part of institutions. Now, getting to that point, and you should tell me, um, you know, or because we have an hour, so I want to make sure oh, I, I stay within, uh, within the frame. Um, but I should also now say that I, I have at the same time been trained in traditions in sociology which are very skeptical about the notion of crisis. So in science and technology studies as a kind of interdisciplinary field, but very much part of sociology, but in actor network theory, ethnomethodology, various practice-based approaches in, in sociology, um, there, there's a strong skepticism about the claim um, to um, exception. So the notion that our time is unlike any other time or the notion um, that problems are unfolding um, that are like um, creating fundamental transformations on a level that cannot be observed by normal people. Like there, I've been trained over many years to have a kind of a observe the, the stop sign when it comes to the crisis diagnosis. Um, and so for me, it's also interesting of how, how, how and why I'm navigating through that or, or, or feel compelled to, to break that um, uh, convention, I guess. And I think uh, one way of putting it is that even though I think a lot of the commitments that led people to be skeptical about the claim for crisis, many of those commitments, I think, are still um, valid. So for instance, the concern um, of theory educating about which problems matter and which do not matter, which is sometimes what positing a, a, a problematic on a structural level has as an effect. Like the concern about that, sort of the knowledge politics uh, of, of positing crisis, as, uh, if you will. Like I think that is a valid concern. At the same time, and, and also another uh, motivation had been the valuation of the everyday, everyday experience as a, as a, as a, as a legitimate plane for, for knowing the social world. 
But I think what is becoming clearer um, in, in, in our current period is that a lot of those criticisms were dependent on the ability to take for granted um, a, a particular liberal democratic order. And so, um, you know, being at that point where, where you can see also how the taken for granted operates in sociology, um, the, the, the move that I'm making and, and uh, what I want to pursue is, is, is uh, to look for different traditions that articulate crisis in a way that acknowledge those constraints. And I think this is where American pragmatism, democratic experimentalism, is a very important point of reference because the, um, the notion that when social problematics proliferate with urgency in the absence of effective action, that, that is a condition that in pragmatist social theory has been recognized as, as very important, as foundational in the 20th century. Um, and the recognition that these problems also put at stake are institutional and normative frameworks. So th that is then what makes them a crisis. And I, I think one of the implications of such an understanding of crisis, of, of, of seeing that the problems are not addressable without calling into question or recognizing that are at stake are, are institutional normative frameworks, that that it can also give you a different understanding of crisis because those kind of situations require experimentation. Um, so, and maybe later we can say more uh, about that. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for the chance to be here. Uh, the organizers in particular. Thanks to Nortje for good comments to kick this off. And, and the reminder to interrogate the notion of crisis when we use it. So I also come out of um, some skepticism, but also some sense that it's a needed concept. But the first thing to say is things getting bad doesn't equal a crisis. Because if you take any long-term view of the human condition, there are a lot of occasions in which things get bad, and then they get worse, and then they get even worse, but there's no crisis. There isn't necessarily a direction of change. The idea of crisis has to signal in some sense that there is a necessary turning point as in the notion of using this to describe a fever. Either the fever breaks or the patient dies. There is a turning point. There is a crossroads in the deep sense of this. And I think we should try to use the word crisis not to mean generally bad stuff is happening, but to mean that in, for some reason there, things are coming to a head and there are a limited number of directional outcomes, and something is going to change. Um, I can maybe illustrate an aspect of that point, but also of what I think is happening in the world with reference to the book that Jacinto held up um, a few minutes ago, Does Capitalism Have a Future? Um, at one point in one of the discussions that led up to this, Georgi Derluyan um, said something like, so, there are uh, two positions here. There's an optimistic and a pessimistic position. Emmanuel Wallerstein and Randall Collins represent the pessimistic position. And Emmanuel immediately piped up and said, what do you mean pessimistic? I said there was a 50-50 chance humanity would survive. And next, um, it was asserted that uh, Michael Mann and I were taking the optimistic position. We immediately piped up and said, what do you mean optimistic? All we said was we thought capitalism would survive long enough that climate change would kill us first. <laughs> and I think that this is um, in a certain sense indicative. I mean, not just that there, are that there are multiple things going on that are producing long-term transformative change in the world. Um, it's not clear how these interact entirely, but the interactions are extremely important. And it's not clear where we're headed in all of this. But the question of crisis is, are there points right, at which this becomes decisive? I think in the connection with the theme of the future of work, we are in some sense in a structural crisis. And Jacinto asked us specifically about structural crises, which carries 
um, in the broadly Marxist tradition from which I come, a certain specific kind of meaning. Um, I think we're in structural crisis or multiple structural crises at different scales um, because there are things happening in um, different ways. We are, live, to take a slightly longer term view, we're living out still a transition from manufacturing to service, a fundamental deep transition in the advanced capitalist economies and with varying repercussions around the world. Um, the language manufacturing to service is uh, problematic and several papers at this conference have explored the wide range of variations of um, occupations and of reward systems and of statuses that go into the category service, um, which simply carries too much baggage. So that variation is an issue. There's an issue that separates um, the uh, transition in substance as a structural matter from sort of contingent things. So in a certain sense, sexism is a contingent factor that has the impact of making it the case that many people in service and carrying occupations are paid much less than they should. It's um, in certain ways more structural that there are all of these demands for these occupations. But be that as it may, we've seen a huge deindustrialization. This is part of um, itself a change in work. It's part of the um, rebellion that has produced populist voices and others in the context of Brexit and elsewhere. One of the features of Brexit is that it's a rebellion of deindustrialized parts of Britain and indeed most of Britain against London and the small number of other places that have benefited um, during this period, but there's a US story, there are stories, there's a French story, the Gilets jaunes, um, to the extent that they represent a sort of non-metropolitan France and a rebellion against a more metropolitan um, France are a part of this. But it continues, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean capitalism is going to end. On the contrary, there's a reorganization of what we might think of as logistical capitalism of all of the things that are about organizing warehouses and transportation systems, Amazon, paradigmatically, Alibaba, um, that transform employment and transform our relationships to place, but continue the process of large-scale capital accumulation. So this isn't necessarily a crisis of capital. Similarly, there's financialization. And a lot of what we think of as a contemporary crisis, which is truly a crisis at the level of work and livelihoods for people, um, is a process of a shift of capital, capital accumulation away from the production of goods and services into making money from finance directly. A massive shift, different national patterns, but for the um, developed capitalist world, the OECD countries, a shift from about a quarter of assets being held in the form of financial assets in the 1970s to three quarters by the time of the financial crisis. So it's not just that there was a financial crisis, it's that finance mattered a lot more and the returns to assets, to investments mattered a lot more. So regardless of the differences in what lawyers and doctors are paid um, compared to clerks or service workers or others. A huge thing that happened was that the long-term process of trying to manage inequality by managing pay levels was undercut by the explosion of return to assets. Investments simply paid off much better. Um, and that started in the late 1970s. This financialization exploded at the end of the 20th century. Now, I don't want to go into simply a long story about that, just, but to give that kind of background to say, when the crisis is, is this a 50-year crisis of a transformation, or is this a crisis of the last two or three years because the politics of response to this have come to a head with a variety of elections in Britain, in Italy, and in the US, and in other places. I think that we need to see the political economic underpinnings of this as a much more basic shift, and we could go on into other factors of that globally and um, with technological change and automation, but I do think it's not a contingent shift, and, and thereby, I mean, it's not mitigatable 
um, in relatively straightforward ways where we could simply change and reverse parts of that. We could mitigate various of the things that are wrong. Um, we could have um, uh, more equitable um, hiring and pay practices. We can't fundamentally undo all of this. That's the crisis. So we will pick ways forward and they will have implications for in responding to the environment, for the future of work, and for a whole series of other things. Well, thank you. Uh, your uh, two uh, answers have raised a lot of new questions for me and probably for people in the audience. And by the way, you'll all get a chance to ask questions. Um, but I don't know if you first want to react to what Craig just said, um, or maybe if, if I can um, make a, a comment. Uh, as far as this characterization of uh, the current historical juncture as crisis, based on um, what you have both um, just said. Um, I didn't um, maybe think about it too much when I um, thought about that term, structural crisis. But now that um, you're talking about um, the economic system just going through a process of reorganization, that um, the process itself does not call into question the functioning of that system. Uh, on the contrary, there is uh, mechanisms of capital accumulation that will continue um, regardless of whether people have or ha don't have jobs or lose their jobs. Um, and yet, and, and it came up in both of your answers, but maybe this is a way to emphasize the idea of a crisis, um, these transformations of the economic system, they seem to be um, jeopardizing the other institutions, especially the political institutions, that sustain that very economic order. And to the extent that this is happening, um, and this is the point you made about institutions not being able to manage it, some of the economic uh, problems and social problems that are created by this transition, if you don't want to call it crisis, in uh, the economic basis of society, then um, perhaps we can uh, use this term with all the like caveats and caution that, that you have called for, um, because there is also the possibility that um, the, the political system would become so unstable that, that the economic process will not be able to go on. That was okay. just uh, my reaction, gut yeah. reaction. To I mean, um, speaking as a pragmatist, um, I would I would not be inclined to um, privilege one swear and say that is the swear um, that somehow where the crisis is instigated or where somehow the turning point um, must be located. So I mean, I think you like speaking as an economic sociologist or speaking as a political economist, I mean, it's not that I don't think it's a valid perspective, because I think it is. But I think I'm interested in something else, which is what happens when we recognize that we have those who locate the crisis um, in the earth, on the level of the earth. Um, we have those who locate the crisis um, in forms of subjectivity. Um, and I mean, that's partly a different, just a different uh, sociological perspective. I think the, the perspective I um, now open up is a, is a perspective of het heterarchy, so where there are multiple orders. Um, and what we need to understand is how problems unfolding in different orders relate. But the, the, one of the reasons um, that I continue to be very interested in that is has to do with the digital. So, um, uh, you know, trying to make sense of digital transformations of society, I keep being struck by the digital initiating um, particular logics or offering a medium that is not quite like economic media. So, um, you could think here of um, a uh, concept that comes from um, 
um, Marcel uh, uh, Maus, the anthropologist of the total social fact, where you can think of, for instance, money as a total social fact because it, it circulates uh, across all kinds of domains of society. And I think the digital is becoming like that, except it's not money. So we're dealing with a kind of a currencies that have, uh, and, and infrastructures enabling those currencies that are connecting very different domains across society, the family uh, to uh, the state, um, insurance sector to um, digital culture. Um, which do that in a way that we don't necessarily really understand yet. Um, and I do think that on the one hand, it is, you know, this is, has the potential to be an academic point. You know, what does it give us to, to think of the digital as a, as a total fact? But I do think it is quite directly pertinent uh, to conversations about crisis. I mean, when, when um, I speak from Britain where I live, I see that a lot of the, the, the crises um, are connected with this particular uh, capacity of the digital. So when you look at the way in which, for instance, the, the, the regulation of migration is, is, is disintegrating with for-profit companies coming in to, to, to test citizens for, for their language uh, capacities um, and then expose subjects as being frauds uh, by applying machine learning algorithms, um, which um, is, is part of um, the, the the, the scandals now circling around the home office, you see that the d digital keeps popping up at moments where a particular domain, in this case, uh, the domain of, 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 of the government's uh, um, role in, in um, uh, regulating its border, gets undermined with, with an educational software company coming in to do, take on a, a role within, um, well, in this case, border regulation. So I think a lot of the sort of the undoing, the dismantling of institutional, uh, established institutional frameworks and, and, and working arrangements has to do with this kind of, a kind of currency and capacities and infrastructures being um, uh, created and activated, which really are not quite a known quantity and therefore are also extremely uh, harmful in, in their effects. So I agree about the ubiquity and the power and the transformative potential of digital technologies and the digital culture and ways of thinking that go with that. So hugely important, but I would draw a distinction between two different ways of being important, which relates to the issue of crisis. So money, it seems to me, is a good example in the most origin of the total social fact idea. There can be more and more utilization of money. It changes things. To move from um, barter or sharing to money is transformative. But there's no crisis in a breaking point sense in quite the same way, which I suspect is also the case with digital, though hard to say. But in any case, becoming ubiquitous um, may contribute to crises in a variety of domains, but it in and of itself doesn't do that. But it's a way of being important. It's everywhere. It's changing everything, which is different from the way of being important that this is an organizational system that um, potentially opens a pivotal change. And I would illustrate that by saying capitalism um, is different and point to uh, something like the, well, the reference made to Moish Postone um, in um, keynote yesterday, but not just Postone's work, the idea of something being historically specific in a powerful way. So there could be lots and lots of changes in the future of work, which we can extrapolate by things we see happening. Um, and then there could be a end to organizing work as the production of capital. It's an end to seeing work as labor in the strong Marxist sense of labor, which is constitutive of capital. And that would transform in a different way 
um, from simply having more automation or having uh, more or less hierarchy or other things. Um, now, wouldn't transform everything. So I think I want to suggest that there are there's a sort of, if you will, vertical and horizontal way of thinking about um, things being important. Um, leaving that, whether you're persuaded or not, on that one. Um, I would say this issue of, of heterarchy is a good way to think about something. So there are lots of things going on. They're connected. It's not clear they are a single system with a single causal structure. Um, and it's not sure, clear that there is a single power structure, that is, that there is anybody governing all of this. They may have different power structures broadly in agreement about that. But there are sometimes decisive consequences. So I don't think capitalism is very likely in and of itself to be at risk with digital technology or with any of a variety of other changes. It seems to me there's every reason to think there can be a reconstitution of the accumulation of capital um, and therefore of capitalism. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't be changed, but it would take social movements, it would take a lot of action to change it. On the other hand, it seems to me that democracy is at risk, that capitalism as we've known it, the modern world system, is a combination of a capitalist economic production exchange system with an organization in terms of states, largely nation states, and that is at risk, that within that, Right? There could be a breakdown of the international order leading to war, or for the rich de democratic capitalist countries, there could be an end to democracy, that democracy could degenerate far enough that it ends. This is where we think of the fascist transition in the 1930s or something. Now, I'm not suggesting we're about to have fascism next week um, in the same sense it came in 1936. What I'm suggesting, though, is that democracy is degenerating in fairly basic ways so that it might not work, even while capitalism continues to be reproduced in various ways. And there are a variety of push factors on this which come from different parts of the hierarchy. Um, so that the, if you will, the migration story, which has a variety of different causes in this, um, um, is one. Um, the, but the capacity, uh, the subjectivities story, um, which, uh, uh, which aren't you alluded to, is also there. Do citizens feel efficacy? Are they efficacious? Do they feel cut off in various ways? Do they feel unable to accomplish their goals in contemporary democracies? This becomes a crisis or problem for democracy, a degeneration of loss of citizen efficacy. Are democracies able to incorporate difference enough for European democracies, um, you could put it bluntly, are European democracies able to incorporate enough immigrants to allow them to become old? Um, allow the populations to become old. Um, it's too simplistic a formula, but it's instructive, right? And it may be that they aren't, right? That many European societies find that too hard. Uh, the dynamics are very generational, as well as inside-outside, as well as economic, as well as political. So I would say that for the general sociology, since you want to ask about the historical conjuncture, um, there are certain pressure points like can democracy be sustained and can people's faith in democracy be sustained that are in a way more imminent than the so-called structural crisis of the capitalist system. Um, I feel we're at a point where we could turn, um, you know, this way or that way. Um, oh no, a crisis. <laughs> we can stick with, uh, with crisis because I think like one, uh, one thing I'm very um, interested in is that on the one hand you have the statement that says change is not contingent. Um, we have a um, we have theories of capitalism that have been developed in the 19th century that we can apply in the 20th century to um, surface what is like an historical necessity. And where that is interesting for me is that I, I, I see also a very different sort of intellectual strategy because what I'm also very much interested in is um, the um, crises 
in um, thought. So, uh, so it may be quite necessary for us as sociologists to um, query critically and perhaps even push to the point of crisis within uh, a constructive environment some of our assumptions. And I said, for me, democracy is prime among them. Uh, so what I've always been very interested in is um, the notion that democracy and many theories of democracy that have been ha handed down from us in the liberal democratic tradition are actually not quite compatible with a technological society. So that all kinds of uh, assumptions around um, the instrumentalization of, of the world um, and the ability to know the world, um, which are both things that in a technological society are, are very much on question, though, that those things have been assumed to be more or less containable in uh, modern theories of democracy. And so I'm also very interested to say that yes, we may be observing crises of accountability, for instance, as I started out with, but maybe what we're also seeing that if, for instance, we see that in this hetero heterarchic universe, interaction between domains is not enabling accountability between domains, that it may be our assumptions about how, what accountability is that we need to rework. And the same on the level of democracy. So, I mean, I've, I've um, been um, working for some time with a concept of the issue public. So a collective, a political collective that gets organized through and mobilized by a problem for which there is no available problem solving capacity. So how do we, how, how do we act as publics and how do actors act as publics in situations where it is assemblies of strangers that face this task of acting on a problem that they share but are also um, um, put into uh, conflict uh, with each other by this problem. So, I mean, this is, that's, this is a way of, of thinking through democracy which is very different from saying, look, it has been institutionalized in, a na in nation states, there has been an arrangement, uh, there have been arrangements of industrial democracy which were sort of functioning in technological societies for a good part of the 20th century. So I think this, how can we also have the, um, uh, I think the confidence, but also the um, uh, maybe the the, the uh, ability uh, for fragility, uh, so, so to be capable to, capable to think things that aren't yet thought through well, um, and this you know how how to do democracy in a technological society for me is is really one of the main candidates there. So great, and actually we should turn some to technology because that's part of our our charge. But it seems to me that it matters a great deal um, for many technologies how they're deployed. So technology, you know, when one says something like a technological society, um, is it a capitalist technological society? Is it a democratic? Is it an authoritarian technological society? Is it, you know, um, what? And, and so, you know, something like Jacques Ellul's use of the phrase is marked by his more or less, you know, his, his roots in a certain way of thinking about what constitutes society. And so then technology becomes ubiquitous and transformative to what constitutes society, but isn't the constitutive thing necessarily, different from the Mumfords. The, and, but I think back to using your term for it, heterarchy, or I would say you know, multiple interacting systems, um, there, these are things that are affecting each other, no one of which is necessarily completely ascendant and dominant. Um, and so we, we wouldn't want to say it's a technological society if by that we mean it wasn't also um, a society um, that was in some part or in some way organized on other principles and then we want to know what. So in a macro way for sociology but also in a way that affects smaller scale phenomena, um, what's up? Um, well, the um, the technologies um, 
which are bundled together under the label digital, right, are a central part of what's going on. So I want to sort of agree, and then we can begin to parse out within that if there are disagreements. But the, uh, and the same thing I said, democracy is potentially in crisis. Well, what is democracy? So you've just evoked a John Dewey notion uh, with issue publics of the way in which the public sphere might be a part of democracy, but instead of being a stabilized Habermasian public sphere, um, there are publics that form around unresolved problems and try to generate solutions for them. And I think the, you know, the Deweyan conception is very powerful. I think Hannah Arendtian conception in which this is our, our capacity to make promises to each other to create something in common in public is powerful. Um, the, so the Deweyan concept and the others run up against power structures. So what is it that gives an issue public the capacity to transform how the issues play out, to um, put their solutions in place? So we have people responding to contemporary challenges by saying what we need is um, local cooperatives in urban areas in non-monetized forms of exchange. Um, and we have others saying, but wait a minute, that doesn't scale up very well or whatever, right? So there's another realm of, of power structures that is the necessary complement um, to this. And uh, we need to look at, at both. Um, the, and I, I would stick with the, the digital and the other cases to trying to distinguish when there's a nonlinear change from when there's more of stuff. Um, what I started with by saying there can be a lot more bad stuff without it generating a linear change. Or people can live with horrible conditions for a long time. Um, you know, India had massive poverty and a caste system of inequality for a very long time before there were large scale movements to change that. Right, it's this separate question from, from that. And here I think the uh, the search for the nonlinear is a really important question for us now if we're going to ask about the conjuncture and, and these changes. And we're not good at it, and we can't be systematically empirical about it because it involves a shift in how variables relate to each other, not only the identification of something that is more or less in all of that. Um, so is there a shift in kind of society? I think very similar to say, you know, digital is a huge shift. What, I, what I'm asking in a sense is what's the, the underlying um, change in what makes society a society? And I think you point to some of it and it's been around for a long time and a huge change. There are scale differences. There are differences in mediation. There are differences in systematicity. So with digital technologies, it's possible to have large scale, more or less impersonal systems that are relatively autopoietic in the Luhmannian sense, um, do more, right? So one of the illusions of discussions of automation is that everybody always says robots might take your job, as though it's individual robots taking individual jobs that is the key thing going on, as distinct from a transformation in how we're connected. Um, the climate change phenomenon is in part systemic. Only people are only part of the story, but are a very definite part of the story. And there's something systemic going on without belaboring the point, say part of what that means is all of us live in a world which is partly opaque to us because distant. And we may be able to get information about it, but we might have to be able to think statistically or think in terms of models to do it. So climate's a strong example, but it goes for digital and other things. There is a demand for different kinds of thinking. I think here I'm elaborating, but agreeing with you. Right? If you start saying, you can't get the meaning of climate change by thinking linearly. Global warming was a problematic phrase because it implied there was something simply linear and didn't get, generate the kind of rethinking of the models of how we relate to nature that would be required. Um, and in the same sense, what would be the rethinking that's required 
for digitization or for a transformation of, of capitalism, which could be something like, say we have state capitalism, say China massively wins international competition, and we still have capitalism more or less, but with a fundamentally different relationship to the political system and to the idea of the corporation as a legal entity. Well, we'd have to think differently. And, and if I hear you rightly, this is the pragmatist point being made, um, and quite correctly, that um, we won't be able to think the new in terms of the old categories. Yeah. I have to say that moderating a pile between both of you is really easy, because <laughs> <laughs> even though I spent a long time preparing questions, I, I realized they weren't um, needed. Um, I'm still going to jump in, um, although you also get a chance to reply. But since you're bringing up um, the question of uh, thought, and um, we mentioned earlier um, the question of knowledge as well. I'd like to understand if what both of you are saying when you say that it's um, perhaps not possible to think uh, these changes that are going on, and when you mention understanding the meaning of climate change, whether you can extend that as an analogy of understanding the meaning of social change, the social change that is currently occurring as part um, because of the digitalization of life. Um, do you see there like concrete impediments to our uh, researching and, and building theories about these processes? Just when I was at the point of letting go of the paper ship of the digital. <laughs> but I can uh, come to this question briefly, uh, say something in, in reply that, um, you know, I am quite aware that I'm, I'm adopting a kind of a, a practice perspective, but perhaps you're foregrounding more of a, a systems um, a perspective. Um, but I think one of the reasons I'm, I'm persisting in that is that for me there are many questions such as very basic questions such as what is the unit, what is the scale, what is the relation, where in social theory there are a lot of um, assumptions uh, baked in uh, with the nation state as a relevant uh, unit, for instance, um, where I think what uh, pragmatist thought, but not only pragmatist thought, also feminist uh, approaches and ecological pr approaches are precisely challenging us to, to open uh, some of these assumptions up for questioning. Because in a lot of the assumptions around what is the relevant unit and what is the relevant scale and what is the relevant relations, there are also value judgments implied. Uh, for instance, about you know how the public sphere relates to the private sphere, um, how uh, materiality matters to social life, um, whether we can assume um, a power relation where um, something like sovereignty, um, even just on the level of the subject, somehow obtains. And I think what, what, what feminists and uh, ecologists and pragmatists will, will do is they will point out many ways in which those assumptions about the scale and the unit and the relation aren't adequate to our problems. And even though I, I think your point of the, the decisive turning point is, um, I mean, it is, it is very important and I think I would be quite silly to be too dismissive of it, but at the same time, I do think we, we are observing a proliferation of um, turning points, yeah. which are marked by intersectionality, they intersect, but it may be that these assumptions around scale, unit, um, and relation are what is at stake too. I mean, sure. yeah. So they're very much at stake, I've been riding around that issue for a long time, which I think social theory has tended to ignore or treat in problematic ways. So scale is of fundamental importance, um, shapes lots of things, complicated. Um, the, you know, and it's missing, right? Or it's, it's missing or it's bundled into assumptions, right? So there are major social theories where you just don't learn anything about scale, um, and what the author thinks. There are a few that open that up in various ways. Um, the, 
but it's not just scale. So back to your notion of, well, the pragmatists, the feminists, the, I think for each of the theoretical camps, um, there's internal diversity. So it's very hard to find the pragmatist position on this, whether you go back to, are we you know, doing um, Peirce or Joyce or who, you know, I mean, there are something, or forward to contemporary range. There's a sort of French school of self-declared pragmatists who are a lot of attention, um, you know, Tevino and Botlansky and so forth, but that's hardly exhausting pragmatism and it's making choices among it. But the same thing is true for every other school, right? And what I would, what I find distressing is an idea of just saying, well, I'm one of these, so I'm gonna think with it. And I don't think, I'm not accusing you of this, but I think it's often the case you, that, and it's a great temptation for graduate students. Who's my theoretical champion? Should I ally myself with Bourdieu or with Habermas or with Thévenot or with, and then I will, it's very convenient because then you don't read work outside your tradition um, and you have um, a place to get into arguments when there's a, an occasion you can say, well, speaking as. But I think precisely the predicament, and I, again, I think, I don't think we disagree deeply about this, the predicament is that no one of these grasps everything and therefore they need to be brought into relationships. So you could make an argument that some of them do better at um, grasping the open-endedness of what may happen. And I think that's part of what you're suggesting for a pragmatist um, position. Some of them do better at grasping parts of the determinations um, that go into that, you know, a Marxist or a whatever position. But, but Thinking the new, back to Jacinto's comment, it's not that we can't think this, it's that we have to think in new ways to think what's going on. And um, take the nation state as an example. You, um, lots of work which rightly questions the nation state does so with a very thin history, forgetting that nation states were created, that the nation state system came into operation through a history of warfare and taxation and you know, a variety of processes, um, and has been stabilized to some extent, except for massive conflicts like the world wars, which are not so stable, um, right? So it's not as though the nation state system simply is there. And, um, and it has a complicated history. It's been incorporated into social theory as a tacit assumption that what a society means is a nation state, right? And, and that's a problematic assumption. Um, but it's also the case that to try to write theory ignoring the nation state and wishing it away and saying, well, actually, let's write as though we don't have nations and borders and governments because we don't like those things is problematic too. And, and so how to, at the same time, think critically about the non-necessity of the nation state and realistically about the genuine power that is going into maintaining borders um, despite all of the pressures that are emerging seems to be the task before us. And I think not just for the nation state, but for almost every other level or, or object of this, our task is to think these seemingly contradictory things at the same time and figure out how they work together. Is it doable? Yes, it's doable, and we, we do it. Is it doable perfectly tonight? No. <laughs> um, but it, as a reshaping, if you think of it as a reshaping of the task of sociology, um, it's, you know, it is doable to reshape that. It will not issue in um, a moment at which all sociologists see things exactly the same way and agree about it. It will issue into new and different debates and questions. Um, as it already is, there's been a return of geopolitics, for example, of looking at space um, to large-scale macro things that was important and went out of fashion. Right? But since the fall, collapse of the Soviet Union um, and a variety of other phenomena um, that are going on in the modern world, there's a lot more thinking about that. So there are ebbs and flows of positions that are older, and you can go back and trace the antecedents of these, um, but there are also simply whole sets of questions that emerge. So um, the you know, feminist concerns changed a set of questions, right? Including questions about the nature of the person. 
and the nature of the person um, connects up to questions about what's public and what's private, and it connects up to what's the nature of a corporation as a strange kind of person that is being posited in some legal systems. And there, you know, it, so it can ramify in directions that are far beyond initial reasons for the emergence of a feminist position because different questions get asked. They're very um, categorical questions about um, what's constitutive. Um, the, and they don't get asked equally by every researcher, right? Some people are saying, it's sort of obvious, who's a woman, who's a man, I'm gonna study pay, rates of pay differential. Some people are saying, it's not obvious. Um, we've, you know, it's destabilized in new and important ways, and we have to explore that. Um, these are gonna coexist, it seems to me, but they change what the lines of debate are going to be about. And digitization, to throw this back to Nurcha, it seems to me does some of the same thing. It, it doesn't answer all the questions, but it changes what the debate is going to turn out to focus on in many ways. Do you but want to say something before I open the floor to the uh, um, audience? Well, maybe one uh, point about um, the change in, uh, that it also entails a change in sort of uh, value hierarchies. Um, so, you know, can the sphere of the family be subsumed in, you know, a concept of the nation state system? Like, there is a kind of a, like, feminism does entail a questioning of those implied sort of hierarchies. And I think it is important for social theory to try and stay with that in order to understand where it leads analytically. So for instance, um, my first book, I worked on um, everyday material practice. Now, that's really at the bottom of the heap, right? Uh, waste management um, in the home or uh, water use um, on the community level. Like, it is, some, it is in a, sort of the value hierarchies of social theory, those are the kinds of practices that, that that's not where the decisive turning point uh, is expected to be located. Yet, if you adopt uh, an ecological and an environmentally informed perspective, those distributed practices of the mundane are actually absolutely um, uh, critical as a plane where the question is asked, can we live on this planet? So, and I think for social theory to, like I know all the reasons why locating um, the, the, the decisive uh, moment uh, for when it comes to the question of societal change, why we would not want to locate it in the moment where people throw car pieces of cardboard in one bin or another. Like I know that there are very good reasons why as social theorists we would not be inclined to go that way. But still, in terms of our analytic capacities, you know, what change, how, what can we learn about our, our for instance, also about our understandings of, 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 of citizenship if we do go along with those inversions of value hierarchies? And I think that uh, that's what I'm very committed to in terms of what I see as my, my job. It's certainly not the only uh, job uh, within social theory, but it's, it's one I really want to make the case for. Yeah. So I, I, I know you okay. on time. I just want to agree, but say it goes on for infinite reversals. It's not a matter of one being right, one wrong, but the need to think from multiple points of view. So we could turn around and say the structures of mundane materiality, which also turned out to be gendered and classed and all kinds of other things in your work, also connect up to the more later work digitization. We say, ah, what about infrastructures and the production of large-scale infrastructural systems that will transform the handling of waste and water um, and which are partly digitized? So the scale goes both ways to the very micro and immediate and to the construction of large-scale systems at the same time. All right, I feel like this high-minded discussion could go on for hours. Um, that would be tragic. We do not have unlimited time. Uh, we actually only have um, 10 more minutes, and so we're going to take questions from the audience. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hands, and we'll hand you a microphone. OK, Ryan. Thanks a lot for this um, talk and insights you delivered. Um, 
I'm a little bit worried because um, I recognize that the process of digitalization and the new data science coming up and all the industries and the privatization of these data production, data infrastructures, is bringing up another phenomena. It is making sociology second rank in terms of being the institution for social research. More and more social research is transferred to privatized companies because they possess the data infrastructure and in quotation marks the knowledge base. If this is a kind of knowledge for us, it's another question. But what would be your perspective on this? Because we can think about our theories, our views. But what about the, the, the risk of being delivered or getting delivered reports from these companies and um, being not replaced, but being in danger to be second ranked in this, this regard. So what could be the reaction of sociology to this? So I think we're actually still with the question of scale. <laughs> and I'll try and uh, clarify why I think that, because uh, there's, I definitely think that in the relation between science engineering and sociology is undergoing very significant uh, transformation um, as a consequence of the rolling out of digital infrastructure for monitoring, analyzing, and intervening um, in social life. But I also think that actually the engineers, at least, I'm not so sure about the, uh, the data scientists, but the engineers have figured out that it, in the context as I just described it, they need sociology bad. They need us. We're very much needed. And why are we needed? Because I think the engineers are understanding that the experimental systems that have been construed and designed for the natural world and for a technological world, that those systems aren't quite transferable to the social world as they assumed um, at earlier stages of this development. So social life is not passive. Um, there are dynamics of interactivity between systems of monitoring and analyzing social life and what happens in those systems. And I think it's this puts us as sociologists in a very difficult position because even as it is increasingly realized how needed we are, we are also very under-resourced. So, you know, how, 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 do we, how do we take on, like how is that challenge someone, one that we can take up in a way that doesn't diminish our our credibility, really, as 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 as, a, as an academic profession, and I, I was bemused that you referred to my book as, as trying out non-academic ways, um, because it, there is an indication that um, you know this this is going to be be difficult. But I I do think that working through the question of how fundamental sociological dynamics of reflexivity, of accountability, of performativity, how these kind of dynamics play out with, within um, uh, social uh, formations that are enabled by digital infrastructures or that simply unfold in digital environments like the smart city, that that's a very big job for sociology and we should claim it as ours. Uh, so I would not uh, in that sense, at least, except for second rate. I would only on the resource level uh, want to go along with that. So let me, I'm, it's a, a good question. I want to be forceful in the answer, but begin by saying I'm not a professor of sociology. I am a sociologist. Um, I'm a, you know, I have a grand title about being a professor of social science, but appointed in um, arts, media, and engineering. So I'm a professor. In, um, working on this, um, and um, so I'm very sympathetic to this notion. But my observation would be there is a very considerable demand 
in the worlds of technology that engineering addresses and in parts of the world of science, for sociology and for the kind of work we can bring. But there's a very poor understanding of sociology, um, and there is an assumption that the questions will be set by techno science, and the sociologists will just help answer it. So um, there will be new inventions, and the public won't like them, and sociologists should explain why the public doesn't like them, but should not necessarily be in on the original part of the conversation about what the new invention should be. Um, so that it's very important for there to be some kind of um, reorganization of the relations among the fields if, if we're going to do this. But it's also the case that my observation over long periods of this with various technologies is there's much more demand for sociological thinking than there is a willingness of sociologists to provide it. <laughs> the problem here is not that the techno science people won't listen. They do listen with distorted um, earphones, but they listen. The problem is we don't want to talk to them. We don't want to learn enough about their technology to get into the conversation. Um, we have our own already established problem sets that our advisors taught us in graduate school, and we want to keep studying the same things instead of um, the shifts, which doesn't mean that we become engineers necessarily. It means that we think differently. There's a return of society. I think in general, the phenomenon society, if you will, is of great concern. Lots of kinds of versions of it in the form of social problems, but also in the form of hopes for all that, and concerns about various kinds of questions. It's back. Sociology has a hard time responding in part because we are balkanized and fragmented into a series of different lines of study where one way to relate that to what um, we were both talking about before is the connections among all these things are really important. If you aren't connecting, say, the gendered character of managing waste in the house to, say, the gendered character of the nation state, and you aren't, you know, you are missing something fundamental. And the, and sociology discourages us from connecting as often as it encourages. It gives us great resources. I love being a sociologist because those things are all there for us. But our usual professional habits are to fragment. So the message is connect all this stuff up and there's a lot better chance of having a big impact and of doing something really distinctive. But also, we are an occupation, you know, like other occupations. And so what parts of our work are most likely to get routinized. Well, certain kinds of conducting data analysis are going to get routinized by uh, new digital technologies. Other parts of the process, including thinking and analyzing these, only partly so. And they're going to, in some hybrid matter, demand both um, artificial intelligence, other kinds of techniques, and human thinking. But the humans need to get good at doing that. And it seems to me we have considerable chance but then beyond all of that, the connecting, thinking the transformations, what we've been talking about, what are the transformations? None of the big issues we face, not climate change, not gender relations, none of these really gets deeply addressed without social transformation. So we better understand that, and we have something to offer. I think we have time for one last question. Um, if there is any, there is one. Thank you for your presentations, um, for the conversation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you, you alluded to the idea of inequality and uh, poverty in the Indian context, and my question is coming from that context, because that's where I'm from. And um, if one looks at how there has been a rise in authoritarianism all over, and one can say that about the kind of government that we have at the moment. And there is a high degree of uh, intolerance when you speak up against the government. So in a, in a context like this, how does the role of a sociologist transmutate vis-a-vis -vis the government, where when you speak about uh, this idea of um, thin history of a nation state, but when you speak about something, the government is actually seen as the nation state itself. There's this collapsing that's happening. So you are also kind of categorized as um, non-patriot or uh, anti-national. So um, 
I'm just wondering then, how does a, a sociologist who is uh, supposed to be a critical thinker, and in, in this context there is a lot of material to be critical about, then how does one locate oneself? Thank you. All right. Ready to go first? No. Um, or, okay. So great question, thank you. And I can only answer part of it, but the, a central part of the question revolves around how do you do critical thinking, sociological examination of basic questions when authoritarian governments or others have um, both the inclination and the capacity to stop it or distort it or squash it, and, and where does it work? And I can only answer a bit by saying that's a, a very widespread condition in the world, and if we think about the production of knowledge all over the world, it's fundamental. Um, it's also the case that sociology is highly unequally organized itself in relation to all of that, so we don't always respond as we might. But it's a couple of things. So first, there's just outright censorship. And the question is not specific to sociologists, it's a question to anyone who wants to speak um, in ways that are uncomfortable for political power. But there's a lot of that. There are new ways of organizing, I'm not sure it means more or less, but new ways of organizing it in a digital world, in a world of changed media, um, in which control may be exerted in different ways. So I happen to have worked in Sudan off and on for a while. Um, and you know things like the government's attempts to control the internet during the time of the revo recent revolution in Sudan are examples. But there are lots of these in other places in the world. More sophisticated versions in China where the government doesn't turn the internet off and on but has more um, largely algorithmically based ways of doing um, censorship and doing it as foregrounding and backgrounding of information as well as shutting down websites. So we live in a world where there's lots of control over knowledge. Those who seek to control knowledge are often very sophisticated in their use of new technologies as well as old-fashioned brute force like arresting people or otherwise contaminate them. At the same time, our institution, the university, is deeply challenged. I won't go back to our discussion of whether it's in crisis or not, but it's not obvious in societies around the world that universities really are bastions where their thought is protected in relation to the outside. On the contrary, there are lots of intrusions into universities, and so the ability to do the academic work is created. But it's not obvious here. We have much less direct political censorship, but we sure have a lot of control over funding streams. We sure have a shift in ability to do assessment that guides people in one way or another um, in universities. So if you add to censorship the way in which people's attention is harnessed and focused, um, there are real issues about the way universities um, work in Europe or in North America too, and about the future of academic freedom in sort of insidious ways. How do decisions about appointments and permanency of tenure um, affect the ability of scholars to do um, what we're calling for, to think in completely non-traditional ways um, about subjects and challenge their seniors? Um, we have, um, academia is heavily influenced um, organized as a system of seniors against juniors in many ways. Well, is that also problematic? So there are lots of ways in which it's hard, no question. They intersect with being hard to think it intersects with being hard to get it out into public and various questions about how things get out into public. And there's a sad bit of research I'll close with on this, which is that falsehood travels faster and lasts longer um, in almost every media arena than truth. Um, and so, article in Science about three years ago, if you want the site, I'd have to pull out the names, right? It's a disturbing feature if we can't believe that truth trumps falsehood, that getting the good data out. But what it means is it takes a lot more argument, it takes repetition, it takes continuing to work at it. It doesn't mean you give up. And I think that's where we stand. All right, so Nurce, you, guess, you get the last words. Um, just for everybody else, uh, we're running a little bit um, 
over schedule, but don't worry if you're going to the social event, the buses are waiting for us, the drivers are actually in the room, so there's no way you're gonna miss it. Uh, Nurja, please. Okay, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I wanted actually to uh, mention an uh, example uh, from the world of digital culture where actually organizations founded in India have been very important um, in informing European understandings of, of digital culture. So this is the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore and uh, the Sarai Center in New Delhi. Now, these are both centers where academics are based, but also many people who are not academics. And um, we're working in a participatory manner. So, for instance, in researching a community um, in a neighborhood, uh, inviting members of that community as participants in the research is one of the, the methods championed. Now, why has this work been so important uh, for digital culture in Europe? In part, because these organizations operated on a very different scale um, from, for instance, the Netherlands, where I'm from, in a ver under very different conditions, but also from a perspective um, that, you know, in an engineered country like the Netherlands, it's quite, the, the engineering of society in India is a completely different phenomenon and I think that kind of um, sort of decentering of our perspectives that happened for instance when I learned about the work of the Center for Internet and Society and so I that that is really very important and that we need to um, again like think along with those initiatives so for instance the study about the travel of truth and falsity that was a study of Twitter um, and among other media, but Twitter was the centerpiece in that piece. Yeah, Twitter is a Silicon Valley designed platform which implements a particular attention economy where um, through propagation you maximize engagement. It is a particular logic um, of, 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 of public attention uh, building where these initiatives that are less their scale, they operate on a different scale, they have a different success, but it may be that in terms of understanding how a public sphere can be done digitally, they may be precisely the place where we would go and try and understand possibilities. Well, thank you very much for uh, both of our panelists. As a token of thanks, I'm gonna give each of you a box of chocolate, uh, um, local famous chocolate, and hold on, hold on. No, no, no. More words of gratitude. Oh, words of few gratitude. seconds. Actually, yeah. I was gonna say that. And uh, well, the first gratitude is for Jacinto oh, on behalf okay, of the I'll organizing take, committee. Thank you. For. For organizing this uh, panel discussion, but also for the great job he did as our program manager, our coordinator, guiding our local organizing committee. And actually, everybody who is in this room knows him or should know him, or should have received at least an email of him because he's also the person behind our Congress address, Congress, uh, Social Congress 2019. So, a large thank you, Jacinto. Thank you. And this is a small gift for enjoying also the day after the conference. There oh, wow. is a life after the conference. Wow, well, thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank my team because they've done an amazing job and I'm going to ask all of them to come up on stage. Um, So, none of us had any previous experience um, organizing pretty much anything except maybe some parties at home. Um, and here we are. Uh, we've done our best. We hope you've had a good time. 
and that you will uh, continue to have a good time. Um, I'm really proud of you guys. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Um, okay, so now um, it's over.